In the mystery of the world, word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts. Please be seated. <clears throat> the words you just heard in the opening prayer uh, might sound familiar. In the mystery of the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts. These words have been recited at the celebration of the Eucharist for each of the last five weeks as we've been stepping together through this season of Epiphany. You might recall that, uh, that this season began with the story of the Magi, seekers from distant lands who witnessed a sudden and startling manifestation of God revealed in human form, the quintessential Epiphany in Bethlehem. In the following weeks, several things occurred. The baptism of Jesus, the gathering of disciples from among working folk uh, in the area, an abundance of miracles, and uh, a preaching that felt new and full of authority. Yes, we've walked these past few weeks with Jesus' companions as they've been transformed in this season of light by the powerful presence, actions, and teachings of Jesus. Today is the last Sunday in, after the Epiphany. It's also known as the Feast of the Transfiguration, reflecting the gospel selection according to Mark. This is a, a pivotal moment in the church year. The season of Epiphany bridges most of Jesus' life from the first manifestation of the Messiah in Bethlehem as an infant to the first steps on the way to the cross in Jerusalem. Today we hear two accounts of mystical transformation, both of them dazzling in their imagery, Elijah's ascent to heaven and Jesus' transfiguration. In his gospel, Mark describes an unexpected experience of God breaking directly into the world. He starts to unfold the story in a straightforward way. Jesus goes to a mountain to pray, accompanied by his close friends, Peter, James, John. Now, they've gone off many times before to secluded places to pray, so this was not unusual. But then something very unusual happened. The three disciples watch in amazement as Jesus is profoundly changed before their eyes, dazzling white, shining like the sun, bathed in light. And if that was not shocking enough, they also witnessed the sudden appearance of two great prophets from the past, Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Imagine the confusion that these three friends must have felt as they saw these apparitions and as they tried to make sense of this startling and unexplainable experience. This scene makes me think of another transfiguration in a different place at an earlier time. You remember that story in Exodus where the Hebrew people were led out of Egypt and out of bondage by Moses? Moses comes into God's presence in the course of their journey to freedom, and he too is transfigured. When Moses walks down from Mount Sinai with the tablets of the covenant, his face is shining so brightly from his encounter with God that his people are afraid, and he has to cover his face with a veil. <clears throat> the term transfiguration describes a mystical moment of radical change, a visible manifestation of the union of human and divine, if only for a few moments. Another story of mystical transformation is revealed in the Second Kings reading this morning. God is ready to take the prophet Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, dramatic, heroic. Everyone in the story knows what's about to happen. Elijah is summoned to his eternal home. He's being summoned with flair. But his protege, Elisha, is not ready for him to go. Elisha desperately wants to hold on to all that Elijah has been to him, mentor, prophet, healer, holy man, cherished friend. He's not ready to let go. 
But seeing the inevitable begin to happen, and Elijah is lifted up, Elisha calls out, well, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. It's touching, I think, and profoundly human that Elisha will not leave his master even as Elijah is being taken up to heaven He wants to stay with him as long as he can and even tries to accompany him on his final journey. Embedded in these ancient scriptural stories of change and transformation, we hear very personal tales as well of human grief. Elisha stayed with his beloved friend as far as he could until he could no longer see him and then he broke down in anguish. Peter, James, and John did not want to lose their teacher, who seemed to be changing into light itself before their eyes. Peter even suggested making dwellings to keep Jesus and the prophets there with them together. Like Elisha, the disciples did not want to be left behind. We can understand how it feels to lose someone we're not ready to let go of. Many of us have taken or will take such a final journey with a loved family member or friend, or we know someone who has. Just a little while longer, we might pray. Don't go just yet. But if you must go, at least give me a double dose of your spirit to keep me going. It's not unusual for grief to be shaped by a deep desire to hold on to the way things are now, even for a little while longer. A few weeks ago, I was called to a live hospice to offer ministration at the time of death for a patient who was in his final hours. The room was dimmed and filled with silent family members in attendance. The dying person's spouse was Stretch out, stretched out on the bed, holding his life partner in an enclosing embrace, providing an intimate final dwelling place as his beloved slipped away. Moments of change, transition, transformation, these often take place <clears throat> in the borderland between this world and God's realm. They might be considered miracle moments, and it's worth recognizing them as miracles, even expecting them as miracles. The transfiguration itself is a miracle story, a revelation of Jesus' full nature and God's powerful presence, a glimpse behind the veil that sometimes barely separates heaven and earth. It's like a hint of the end time. And we need miracles. Miracles need to be experienced. Perhaps this is a clue as to why Jesus instructed his friends to tell no one what they had seen. What? Yeah, it's a miracle. An intensely real and personal experience of God that cannot be fully described or explained or understood. It has to be experienced. From time to time, I've been asked if Bible stories of Magi and and healings and radical transformation are real. Do miracles really happen? What a natural and understandable question. I can only reflect on my own personal experiences of wise ones who showed up at just the right time, of miracle moments, uh, unexplained healings, and unearned forgiveness my own witness of lives transformed in unexpected ways. I've come to understand these moments as personal experiences of God's presence here and now. I certainly know them to be real. Accounts of transfiguration are stories about crossing frontiers, about journeying towards the edges of life and death, the liminal spaces between the temporal and the eternal, the physical, and the mystical. Both of today's stories, Elijah and Jesus, reveal transforming personal encounters with God. 
They are reminders that God walks with us on our journey, in our time, uniting us personally with the infinite, the unknowable, the real. When God speaks, change occurs. It's good to listen. Early in this season of Epiphany, we heard God's voice at the River Jordan, the baptism of Jesus. You are the beloved. With you I am well pleased. Today on the high mountain, God's voice speaks again from the cloud. This is the beloved. Listen to him. God's voice echoes in our own lives. And it has the power to transform our lives. Listen to Him. When everything is going your way, and when everything is going against you, listen to Him. When you see need or hurt or injustice in the world, listen to Him. When you hear a call to give or serve or release, listen to Him. When you experience the need to forgive or be forgiven, listen to him. In the stories of Jesus' transfiguration and Elijah's ascent to heaven, the dead are not lost. The living are not left behind. Grief and suffering are transformed by the inner confidence that we shall be together again in love as we always have been, as we always will be. The season of light is upon us. The light was breaking in when Moses came down from the mountain. The light was breaking in when Elijah was being raised to heaven. And the light was certainly breaking in when Jesus was transfigured on high ground. Well, that same light breaks in today. And it flows through us. Expect it. Breathe it in. Consent to it. Allow yourself to be changed by it. Our God, you alone are the source of all life and light. You are the fire on the mountain. You illumine all things you love. Kindle your spirit within us, we pray. For alone we flicker. Together we blaze.